Hello everyone, today we're going to take a look at how we can optimize landscape materials to get the best results. Make sure to stay around for the last tip since that might be the most important one for you. So, if you're migrating from an alternative rendering software to Enscape, you might be used to having a ready-to-use material library. But Enscape instead lets you decide the materials you want to import to your scene through your modeling software. I myself use SketchUp, but the workflow is similar with different modeling software as well. But before you import your materials into your modeling software, you have to make sure that those materials check a few boxes. So firstly, you want to make sure that the textures that you are using are seamless. Basically, this means that they are designed in such a way that the patterns repeat vertically and horizontally when they are arranged in a tiled format. Here you can see the difference between a seamless and a non-seamless material when they are applied to an object. As you can see, the texture gets cut off and is definitely not as realistic in the non-seamless material. If you got that one checked on the list, the next thing you want to look out for in materials is to make sure that they are PBR. PBR stands for Physically Based Rendering and it just means that PBR materials are based in the real world and they're very realistic. There's a few sources that you can get PBR materials for free, like sharedtextures.com, texturebox.com, ambientcg.com, which are all great places to get PBR materials for free and I'll leave a link in the description for each one of them below. So, once you choose a material that you like, you will see a few maps that pop up for you to download. And each one of them has their own purpose. Most of the time for Enscape, you won't need to use all of them. I usually download the diffuse map, the roughness map, the displacement map, and the bump map. Once you download them, you can easily apply these to your renders in Enscape, but we're going to take a look at that later. Once you've checked that off the list, we can go back to our Enscape window. So, one of the best features that the Enscape materials offer is that through naming the material correctly or using keywords, you can automatically give the material the setting that it needs to look realistic. For example, if I type Chrome in the Material tab, it will turn the material automatically to Chrome. The same goes with Glass as well, so if I type in Glass in the Material section, the material turns to Glass and it automatically has transparency or a lower opacity. If we go to the materials tab in Enscape, you can notice that there are some already pre-made materials that we can switch to. For example, the grass option gives you the opportunity to turn a texture into 3D grass. If you've already named your texture grass and you've used the keywords like we suggested before, you won't really need to switch to this option. But if your material is a named grass for some reason, you can notice that the texture is really flat and it does not look realistic at all. And as we said, we can fix that by switching to the grass option. You can also change the parameters of grass through the height and the height variation slider, which adds a random factor to the grass height. The other option is clear coat materials, and the clear coat material imitates the type of paint that you find on car bodies. So basically this is an option that you want to use in cars or ve vehicles in general or other kind of things of that nature. Albedo is the base color input, or also known as diffuse, and adjusting the texture and the tint color in the Enscape Material tab will adjust it in the SketchUp Material Editor as well. When you feel like the texture you've applied is too harsh, you can always use the fade option to tone down the lines or anything similar like that, just like I did with this wood material right here. Below you can find the self-illumination option as well, in which you can make materials emissive, and we can adjust the luminance or brightness and we can change the color of the light that it emits as well. Just like we did in this light bulb right here. Transparency is another option where we can adjust how transparent a material is from the opacity slider. But if the opacity is at 0%, we cannot change the color from the albedo section. But we instead have to change it through the tint color option. The refractive index slider lets us control how light bends through the glass that we have selected. And the other option, the frosted glass option, lets us blur the glass, but when you have this activated, you also need to make adjustment to the roughness of the material as well. So, if you want to create depth to your materials and make them look more realistic, we would be using the height section. 
So to create depth to our materials that we have applied, we can import our own maps or we can let Enscape create them based on the diffuse texture that we imported. But I would recommend to almost always use the maps that we downloaded from the websites that I showed earlier. Just go to the materials tab and add them in each of their own section and you won't have to go through the physics and technical stuff on how much a material reflects in real life and other stuff like that since the PBR maps will do that for you. If you click the drop down menu you can see that there's the option for the bump map, the displacement map and the normal map. The bump map is more used on materials like wood when you want to use some bumps. The displacement map is more used in materials like tiles or brick that need to have some height between them to make the tiles more separated from each other, just like the example that I showed here. We can use the slider to determine how intense we want the map to have on effects on our material. The final option that we have on our material editor is the reflections. The lower the roughness, the more reflective a material is. We can use a roughness map here as well, or we can adjust it manually to our liking. We leave the metallic slider at 0% for non-metals and we leave it at 100% for metals. We won't usually leave it in between since there's not many materials that fall into that category. Usually metallic surfaces behave more like a mirror and reflecting a clear image of their surroundings while non-metallic surfaces show more of their actual surface and they reflect the environment rather vaguely. And then we have the specular slider. Uh, this value controls the amount by which light is being reflected when hitting a non-metallic surface. But if you're not too familiar with these settings, I would always recommend to leave it around 50% for realistic results. Alright, so if you've already got the basics down, we can go into some tips that are a little bit more advanced. Thank you very much for watching the video up to here and I'm very happy to give you more advanced tips on materials. But before I do so, make sure to check out my Patreon where I will do monthly Q&As, review your architectural images and give you access to all the files that I use throughout my videos. So make sure to check that out in the description down below. Alright, so it is very important to always pay attention to the map alignment. So as you can see, we have similar elements in our scene with the same material applied to them. And as of right now, the way the texture is aligned on them is identical with each other. This is not the ideal scenario for our scenes, since in real life, this rarely happens. We would want to change that through selecting the texture, right clicking, hovering the mouse on the texture, clicking position and change the way the texture is aligned in that object. This will help us apply imperfection to our surfaces and make them not look like they're copied and pasted to one another. The other thing that I would really recommend if you're going for high quality results with your renders is that you'd really want to apply imperfections on them. You can do this by importing roughness maps that contain scratches or fingerprints depending on what material you want to apply this to. For example, what I usually do is create a copy of the material that I want to apply the map to and then on the surface that I want to add imperfections, I add a new selection with a freehand pencil so it is as irregular as possible. Just like in the kitchen cabinets here. I make sure that I have selected the material that I created as a copy and I apply the fingerprint map in the roughness map. And as you can see on our landscape window, we already have fingerprints on a spot that would be used in real life to open cabinets. It is always suggested to use imperfection in renders since that is what makes spaces look more natural and they just look more like how spaces would be found in our daily life. Alright, so I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope you found it helpful. If you did so, make sure to click the like button and subscribe to the channel since there will be a lot more videos uploaded sharing a lot more value in the future. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.